Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva, and I'm hosting the summit together with my friend and colleague Ben Roberts, who is with me today, and the other colleague and friend, Eva Schoenfeld, who is not here today, but is also doing some other interviews. We have today with us Mary Alice Arthur. Welcome, Mary Alice. Thank you so much for the invitation. And Mary Alice, you've been a story activist specializing in using story in service of positive systemic shift and to access and create collaborative intelligence on critical issues. You bring definitely the love of powerful questions and the craft of creating compelling conversations to your gift of working with stories. And we're, we're really happy to uh, explore with you today the role of story in working with conflicts and with change in, uh, in ourselves, in our societies. So once again, welcome. Thank you have many other things. This is just a little bit of, your, of who you are and of your journey. So I know you also, for instance, from other, spa, other places, from the art of hosting community. Mm. And um, yeah, I would love, perhaps we start with just inviting you to tell, to share a bit of your journey. What led you to start to work with stories and uh, be doing the work we do, to, we do today in the world? Um, the seeds of those kind of things really lie very much in my childhood where I was a love, I had a love of reading. I used to walk to school reading two books at once. I would say I was fortunate I lived in a flat place. <laughs> so I love stories like that. My dad was an English teacher, but I didn't know about storytelling until I was living in New Zealand in my 30s and went to the first storytelling festival there because my dad and his dad before him were both products of war. My grandfather went to World War I. My dad went to World War II. He just died in 2017 at, at age um, 94. And those guys didn't tell stories. They were silent. So I didn't really learn about the power of stories until I saw them in action at a storytelling festival. So if you can imagine me as an adult sitting in small chairs at a school, listening to somebody tell a story and seeing dramatically how it impacted people, people being visibly moved. And I had two thoughts simultaneously. Number one was like, wow, what was that? And then number two was, I wonder if I could do that. You know, when you see something, you go, I wonder if I could do that. So I started to learn about stories by hanging out in the um, library in the folktales, myths, fairy tales section, 298.7, and kind of <laughs> like this as much as I possibly could. And I remember one time asking a storyteller, what stories do you tell? And she said, the ones that fit on my tongue. And I thought to myself, wow, that's an interesting way to think about it. But I realized that was the case. You know, stories that are meant to stay with me are ones I can remember. It's not that kind of hard yakker of trying, trying, trying to learn something. It's rather if they sit with me, if they come with me, if they arise out of me, then they're mine to tell, which is kind of interesting. And over the course of time, I've had to learn how to trust myself that the story, the right story for the time will arrive in that moment. So I started at first looking at the kind of performing and very quickly realized, number one, I didn't want to be a storyteller for kids, <laughs> which was the only way to make a full-time living in New Zealand was to go from library to library and tell stories to kids. I thought, I'm not here for that age group. I, I like reflective things. I like deep things. I want to really kind of, mm, you know, what's in that? What does it mean? Where is it resonating? What's going on? So it's like I knew I wanted to be with adults. And given that I was a facilitator shortly after the time I learned about stories, then I suddenly realized also, I don't want to be the only voice in the room. How is it possible that everybody's story comes into this place? And so the, the art of kind of weaving facilitation, which then has become for me hosting, together with the power of stories is an interesting one. How does everybody's story show up? And I think this is a critical question in the world right now about Whose stories are we listening to? Whose stories never show up? Whose stories do we value and account? Like we suddenly at the beginning of COVID, in, at least in the North American 
sphere started to hear about celebrities who had COVID, not necessarily anybody else, whose stories are allowed to show up, whose stories aren't, uh, whose stories, I remember a, a, a First Nations woman in Canada or British Columbia, I was on a call with a group of First Nations people around storytelling. And I remember being kind of surprised, oh my goodness, this is like, as they say, taking coals to Newcastle in the British speak of these people live with story. They grew up with story. That's the way that they are trained from a long time. Why are they inviting me to talk about story? But I realized I was in this conversation to listen to the pain of being told when I try to share my story, I have people tell me it's not true. The ultimate pain of having your own story devalued or moved aside or that didn't happen or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, that was that was for me to listen to at that moment. That was the service I was providing. So how story activism came into it was watching an interview with New Zealand actor Cliff Curtis. He's a uh, Maori who is an, an indigenous New Zealander, and uh, he often plays the the villain roles. I was watching The Last Airbender recently. He plays the Fire Nation uh, emperor. Uh, so he's often playing the kind of villain roles. He's a swarthy character, but a very good actor. And he was interviewed and he said, you know, anybody who's working with stories, he didn't say quite say it like this. This is how I took it. Anyone who acts with, who is working with stories is an activist. And I went, oh, I'm a story activist. It's like my ears perked up. You know how that kind of happens? Like, oh, I've heard the mission state. I've heard, I've heard the role title of yeah, me. <laughs> so I remember Juanita Brown, who's the uh, co-finder, co she calls herself of the World Cafe saying, don't take the word activist. And that's like, no, I want to take the word activist because I want to reclaim words. I want to reclaim this word as not being against something, but for something. So we all know that story is the human activating system, the way that we make sense and meaning of the world and therefore our capacity in it. Whatever we believe we can do comes from the basis of story. And it's usually so far in the, in the groundwaters that we don't know it's there. We don't know it's influencing us. But in every moment and every decision, a story in somewhere in our psyche and our values are influencing what we do and where we can take action. So, you know, I, we know that that, so a story activist is someone who knows about the power of story and is wanting to help people become aware and awake to that power and to reclaim it for themselves. And the activism part is what stories are we choosing to activate now? Because it's critically important what we decide to pay attention to, what we don't and how we decide to use that. And, how skillfully we can find each other even when it's hard. And the three of us have talked about sometimes when it's hard. You want to be with somebody on something and it's still hard because you're human and maybe your stories are clashing. So that has begin, begun to be a real field of inquiry for me. So I don't come here purporting to know exactly how to do this thing, but to rather say, I think I'm the best person to be an inquirer about this because it has grabbed my attention. And I love questions and I love being in practice and, and hosting people to find their own brilliance. And those things kind of come together in this piece. How do we find the stories? How do we host them into life? Thank you so much for that. I was, I was thinking that would be, would be great to know a bit like which, which questions you start off this journey of working with stories that you have now a kind of a, 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 a good enough answer as you move forward and, and then perhaps later on in the conversation, you can also hear a bit of what are the open questions you have these days. But I'm curious to see like what insights you have because you have been working with this for already some time. So I'm sure there's different, different takes you, you, you got from, from experiencing it in practice. I think the first one is coming from, uh, my journey as an intentional nomad. So about 2010, when I left New Zealand after being there almost 30 years, I realized my, my, the journey was taking me into the world on the road and I kind of packed my suitcase and I had no um, permanent address for a number of years. So th of that's the part of uh, the, the story of Ma Mary Alice, the wave. <laughs> yeah. the, yes. the being, being in the quant, the quant <laughs> well sometimes it was the particle showing up in the field and sometimes I was the wave <laughs> but the cool thing about that not living anywhere is the fact that you're not actually in the story everybody else is in so I found myself coming in going why why is it like that <laughs> people would look at me like uh, so 
story has often been called the obelisk in the middle of the marketplace. It's so visible that nobody sees it anymore. Mm. So it's interesting to kind of be somewhere. So here's an example of uh, that question, what story are we in and why? So a fundamental curiosity of what story are we in and why? This is uh, Bob Stilger, who's also going to be on this summit, would talk about the Japanese concept of the sacred witness. Mm-hmm. So the one who comes from outside, who is given the role to actually to ask questions and to point out the obvious things that nobody is actually noticing. And I felt like life had given me that role because I could. I didn't have kids. I didn't have a family. Uh, an immediate my this is me. <laughs> so I had the ability to up stakes and take my suitcase and be a provocateur, I suppose, in the world. In fact, my suitcase says on the side, what question could change your life? So as I'm rolling through the airport, I, this is my portable public intervention. <laughs> <laughs> it says, what story, what question could change your life? And the other side says, uh, take back the power of your story. So whenever I notice anybody noticing that, I'm like, <laughs> you're in my workshop now, dude. <laughs> so that kind of question what story are we in so an example of that in 2015 i was in the czech republic this was at the point in time where the wave of refugees was coming from syria more dramatically into europe now this wave had been going on already for more than 15 years it's just that nobody had really noticed it all that much but it came became much more dramatic at that moment in time And as the refugee wave started to come through different countries, different countries reacted in different ways. The Czech Republic reacted in trying to capture those people and put them somewhere. Even though they were trying desperately not to stay in the Czech Republic, they actually didn't want to stay in the Czech Republic. They were trying to go further north. And the story started to go around, these people are dangerous. They're here to take everything. They're here to take our land, our wealth, our riches, our women, whatever the story was going to be. These people are dangerous and we should uh, act accordingly. And I began to ask, where does this story come from? People were like, what do you mean, where does it come from? The president has said, no, but where does the story come from? Oh, so they began to think back and they went, okay, let's see. At a certain point in time, the Soviets came. At a certain point in time before that, the Nazis came. At a certain point in time before that, the Ottoman Empire came and back and back and back. In the marketplace, there in the center of town in Prague, you can see the oldest astronomical clock in Europe. And on that clock are four figures. And they all represent to the Middle Ages and things you should pay attention to. One of them is death, you know, so that looks like a skeleton. So you Mm -hmm. should be aware the end is coming, morality, mortality will catch you and you will have to abide by whatever sins you have committed in this world. One was the was a guy with a bag of money. Beware the sin of avarice. Mm. One had a mirror. Beware the sin of vanity. And the final one, the one on the right-hand side, has a turban on and he's facing that direction of Constantinople, shaking his head. Do not be mesmerized by those who come from other places. So the story is on the astronomical clock. It plays out every hour on the hour. It's as old as 1400 something or another, and probably older than that. So this story has been playing itself out again and again and again. This is just the latest iteration of it. It's very interesting to say, what story are we in? So that's one of the profoundly big questions you can stop and ask yourself. And it's not necessarily easy to see, if you take this reality as that's simply how it is around here. Yeah, how much it's, uh, the, what, what is normal, right? We've been talking also about levels of normality where are totally abnormal, but when you are in it, you don't, you don't get it. Hmm. What story are you in? And I, I'm kind of find something curious that there's something curious about that question that I, I've been working with education for a long time, and I realized one of the main challenges with education, and it's perhaps one of the reasons why we are so stuck in an educational system that is so 
monolithic in a way is is the the, the lack of imagination like people don't know first of all many times we, we don't know that we don't know something so when we are the problem of being stuck in a story is you don't know that there's other possible stories to 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 go about mm-hmm. so i wonder like how you work with this in a way that can you know um allow people to start to open up to to other possibilities because of course if you don't if you just you are caught in one single story. I mean, uh, uh, there was, there's even this the, the mono myth, like yeah, that um, the, hero's the, journey, the hero's, the hero's journey, the hero's journey is a mono myth. Is, is a mono myth. Yeah, I for one have been going. I'm I'm getting a bit tired of this. <laughs> Isn't I, I, there is I, there anything else we it's can great do? To say that because I think, for instance, the moment we are in in history is a moment where definitely that mono myth is not serving us anymore. And I've been thinking like that. That is very much masculine myths. For instance, feminine myths are much more about dissolution and, you know, disintegration. Like the woman starts as a princess and then ends up totally destroyed in, in, in what was her starting point as a princess, right? But that feels much more like the kind of path we need to, to go for as well, humanity. It, of, the, of story, the story you're pointing to is the story of Inanna the queen of heaven and earth, right? So Inanna, in in her arrogance of, I'll just go and comfort my sister whose husband has died, the queen of the underworld. I'll just go there and I'm sure she'll be glad to see me. Oh no. <laughs> the shadow the shadow kingdom was not glad to see Inanna and what it, what it forced her to do at every gate. And that's actually, it's an initiation story. And at the theory you is that there's in fact a, a modern take on the Inanna myth on one level. So every gate, Inanna is forced to give up a symbol of her power and station. And she goes through the seven gates that kind of, that kind of indicates the, the human energetic system. And she has to give up something. So finally, when she's standing in front of her sister, Irishkagal, she is naked. And Irishkagal goes, you know, like, who do you think you are? And she kills her and hangs her on a meat hook. Fortunately for Inanna, she had a few people looking out for her father. Her father was kind of aware she was, she was gone down there. And she's like, and he sent these two little beings down there who went to Arishkagal and just comforted her, gave her solace, which was the first time she had received that. And she said, I'll, I'll give you anything you like. And they said, we'd like that body hanging over there. That's how they got Inanna out of the underworld. And then she comes back and, and, she had she had left her part, partner Demusi in charge, so it's kind of like leaving your dude in charge of the house, and he decides to watch Monday night football and invite all the guys over, and everything is a mess by the time you get home, and you are so enraged that you go you, because the 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 idea was, Yanana could come back out of the underworld, but the part of the bargain was she had to go back there, and so she in fact said Demusi had to go back there. <laughs> she said him. <laughs> Because he had he had been you know like misbehaving, but this is this is the earthly cycle of the the earth sleeps for half the year and then wakes up for half the year. So this is actually a a, a picture of the the cycles of life mm. that for some time you need to go into the underworld and pay attention to the dark, the deep, the rest, the nurture, the the, the field lies fallow. You get confronted by your shadow. You know that's actually part of. The benefit of COVID nineteen, if we want to look at it like that, is yeah, it feels been asked hard. to go home. What does it mean? You know, what Robert McFarland's book Underworld Underland. He he talks about the anonymous, I think, in that, and it, it's um, yeah, he's a poet, but he's doing kind of a sort of experiential journalism around all the different ways where humanity is engaged underground. And I'm looking on your website, and and that. There's a thing that that looks like the the cave paintings of people's hands in the in the piece about practicing being being human together, mm-hmm. um, which he also talks about. And Joe, in our conversation earlier, these are kind of random connections. I'm noticing. You know, I was talking about this this great arc of history in deep time and the the pivotal moment when humanity, as a species, when we started creating art. And he didn't say telling stories, but I think that would have been part of it. And it's also you know when we're when we're putting these images in caves. So mm-hmm. there's something about our capacity to metaphorically understand our world in this very sophisticated way that's quite ancient, right? 
and that we are now pretty blind to. We, we, our, 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 our modern story of science and technology and enlightenment and progress has completely devalued that indigenous wisdom. So you told the story of the woman, you know, the pain that, that, that the indigenous peoples were experiencing by being told their stories weren't true. Mm -hmm. And that seems like another key thing to explore is, you know, when is it that our stories, where, where do we have to understand that truth is, is about something much more than just, you know, did this or this, this thing, is this a factual thing or not, right? There's a deeper truth to some of these stories, but there's also that we get so attached to stories and we treat them like truth and we need to, to complete them and move beyond them. Um, so I'm curious how your work navigates those, those different dimensions. And, where that's in service to conflict and, and how we work with it generatively. One of my favorite sayings is we live in a story and that means we can change it. So that is, that is true. You know, that's the human operating system. Scientists would say, you think you have memories, but how many of them are actually accurate? It's been pretty much proven that so much of our memory is not accurate. It's uh, made in the moment. It's, and it's, it's reshaped as we consider it. And sometimes I found myself looking at pictures in a photo album and thinking, was that the, do I have that memory because I saw this picture? Is it actually real? And then my sister, my youngest sister, who has like technicolor memory-itis, she can go like this, this, this. And I, I look at her and I say, was I there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because I used to joke, I have like four, four lies I always say to, I kind of, it's like a pattern. I, I start to lie it's, it's, it's like futile these little lies but one of them for instance is that i was uh, in the same school that Mourinho was my teacher and, and that was a stupid joke that we created some years ago but the funny thing is i told that story so many times that i actually have uh, vivid memories of him being my teacher you know so that's really funny but that 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 for me brings another thing i would like you to 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 bring also as you respond to to ben, but is this idea that the past is alive, stories are alive, that's not that we own stories, actually many storytellers tell that actually stories owe us, that they work with us and they become alive through us, but they have their own ways, you know, in, in, in a way. And I think most people, and I just want to point that out because it's very easy to get stuck in, in, in looking at stories like many of other practices we look around that where we kind of instrumentalize it right but just to bring it to another place yeah, and that's that's one reason we started this little initiative called story of the future because uh me and uh, two davids david drake and david hutchins we were really sitting and this was just before 2016 we started talking about this the way that you know anything that gets into harvard business review has become pretty mainstream by the time it gets there right so when they start talking about the power of stories then the rest of us go a little bit uh-oh because that means it's becoming a tool it's becoming a method it's becoming you know, something that we can manipulate. And the three of us in our, in our deep conversation together, we, go, we said to each other, where's story at right at the moment? And we said, we, we think there are three waves of story. The first one is the wave of influence. And we are in that wave really strongly right now. It's like, it's like the surfboarding wave, you know, like the big wave in Hawaii. It's one of those waves right now. Everybody wants to know about storytelling because they want to influence something. What's the next story, you know? Mm. Um, or I want, uh, please believe me, I'm a great leader or, uh, please buy the product because our story is really good. So people are using stories like that. And the wave has become pretty big back when I first ran into organizational storytelling in, in 2003 there, I used to say, this is a fresh green field and there are a few people out standing in it. <laughs> now, you know, like every other person you poke is a storytelling specialist, and we call everybody a storyteller too. You could be a politician, a musician, an author, that's okay, but you know, anything, and they all get be, be, be called storytellers. But the storyteller had a traditional responsibility, and the traditional responsibility was to remind people of who they were and how they fit into the world and how all of these things are together. That's why every indigenous culture has a trickster being, you know, for Native Americans, it's the coyote. For the Pacific people, it's Maui. Maui is a demi demigod. If you, if you um, watched Moana, you'll see a little bit yeah. about Maui. And that really captures his bit of trickster energy. He, the dude can do some stuff, but he's kind of stuck in a little, woo! <laughs> oh, <laughs> got off there a little bit and 
uh, messed up slightly. So Maui is always doing weirdly weird stuff. But the reason New Zealand exists is because traditionally spoken, Maui pulled it up out of the sea in the form of a giant stingray yeah. and then asked his brothers not to cut into it. And they did. And that's why New Zealand looks the way it does. So these, the storytellers did that, but they also held on to history for us. So we know that from the bardic tradition, from the Celts, for example, do not piss off your bard because then they will, they will make a sarcastic story about you, which you will never live down for all history. The story will be there and you'll be stuck in it. So like, be careful who you're, who you're irritating there because the story has the power. Mm -hmm. And the reason the big myths are still around is because they still speak to us. If they didn't, they would not be here. There's something fun. You know, when people use that kind of trivia, oh, that's just a myth or an old wives' tale. That's one, a couple of ways to diss story. And in fact, in New Zealand, Australia, probably Britain too, if you say, don't tell me stories, what you mean is don't lie to me. So this is yeah. another word we have to reclaim, the word story itself. And the, the thing might not be that we need a totally new story, but we need to look back and see how the old stories now need to speak in new ways. Because it's not the indigenous people didn't know anything. You know, you can find an indigenous lore. They knew the circumference of the earth. They knew the way the star systems moved. I remember reading in National Geographic at one point in time that a, a scientist had been unable to crack something he was working on around volcanoes. And he found an old story about Pele, the fire goddess, which actually spoke to exactly the thing he was wanting to know and turned out to be true. So it's kind of like, hmm. Mm. So going back to this, putting the, the painting, you know, I think at the same point in time, we made art, we made song, we made story and poetry. And we put everything we knew into those things. It's just that we lost the keys to the coding. We can't remember that we knew it already. And then we turned away from those forms and got enamored with all this other stuff. So one of the beautiful things of the internet is people can tell their own stories. But the internet is a massive mirror for discernment. How much of it is valuable and how much of it is true. So discernment, and I'm not reading judgment here, but good discernment is a capacity we all need to develop. The challenge is every time we have a new development in our humanity, something gets lost. So when Gutenberg came up with the printing press, yay, but then the oral tradition started to get lost. Mm. When we got, uh, I remember the moment I saw the movie Minority Report and I saw Tom Cruise with this little glove doing this with images and I was sitting there with a phone and an iPod and I went, you know, uh, someday these things are going to go together and I'll be able to pay the taxi with it. Well, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. But the moment we start, and now we all know what this means, you know, this little the gesture of swiping. Like yeah. Yeah. So, but when, when Google maps started coming about, people stopped being able to read maps. So every time we make something that moves us forward, we also lose. And the, and the challenge with this medium that we're in at the moment is that our attention span has been very short. People find it very difficult to follow a storyline for very long, and therefore the soundbite is king. But is the soundbite true or not? If we remembered it's all about stories, we'd be saying to each other, wait a second, where does that story go? Where did it come from? What is it leading to? And it's in service of what or whom? Let me interrogate this story to find out. If I step into this story, not from the protagonist's point of view, the main character, but from another character and look at it from a different angle, what does it say to me? And that means I can do that with my own story too. If I feel really stuck in a story, I could decide to go into the story from the third person. Once upon a time there was, um, and she was born to the court, the royal court of King Arthur. I'm, I'm being serious here because my parents put out a birth announcement that the princess royal and heir apparent had been born to the King Arthur's court, you know? And so like secretly <laughs> I'm a princess. It's just nobody knows it. And I didn't for a long time either, but what story was I born into and what am I making of it? And if I look at it from further back, you know, if I can get some distance on it, could I actually learn something? So a significant piece of storytelling recently in the United States, I think, was from the New York Times 1419 project, which was the first time a slave ship appeared on the horizon and fundamentally started a story running in this country that has, for the most part, been unseen and unrecognized. And, and for the most part, we haven't wanted to recognize it. But that particular piece of storytelling 
was quite fundamental in reframing a a national story that actually has impacted the world because our financial systems around the world are based on this storyline. So it's interesting to say, okay, if I really dig into where does this come from, what is the story of this? Or as a New Zealander would say, what's that called when it's at home? (laughs) You know, what do I find out? And if I know more of these things, I could say, I'm, I would like to decide to be in a different story. So what do I have to do to work on those pieces of that? And who would I have to call in with me to help make that happen? Not saying that this is easy work, it isn't. No, it's not. And I, I'm thinking like how, uh, how, how interesting that is, particularly in these times where it feels like we're being called to really drop down somehow the baton to let go of stories that don't serve us anymore. But we are still kind of in all levels of our lives stuck in stories. One is like the story of who I am. Many people I see Mm -hmm. around me are fixed, you know, like senses, rigid senses of identity. This is who I am. And and often confusing experiences with, with, you know, how you respond to them and all sorts of different things. That's why we get caught in traumatic um, uh, cycles, but also then the the the, the stories we tell about uh, what's life, and I'm I'm just thinking like how much how many people want to go back to normality before like yeah, well, yeah, like if normal. normality before COVID was already something that was uh, use of service to us somehow. So no no we we don't have a, a lot more time. So I wonder like I know you have some things to show regarding you know some of the aspects of, of uh, story activism that you, you, you've you kind of unveiled and would be great maybe to, to show a bit of that uh, to our listeners. Yes. So just two things to say before that time. And number one, why is it difficult to change the story? And you've, you've put your finger on it there because our identity is attached to it. And I think that's been one of the gifts and the greatest challenges of the COVID-19 crisis is it has kind of on one level, just in you know two seconds, stripped away people's identity. I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm the other thing. And asked us, what is essential? That's actually very interesting. Are you actually the work you do? Or are you valuable as a human being instead of a human doing? And what would happen if we actually looked at that possibility? So our, st- our identity is so closely connected with the story that it's, a, it's simple, but it's not easy. So a narrative therapist would often say, the person is not the problem. The problem is the problem. So if we itify the problem, so what is your relationship to the depression? Not I am my depression. You know, how do we separate those things from our identity so that we can have a better look at it and decide, do we w- still want to be on the dan- in the dance with this? <laughs> I have a a friend, uh, Paul Costello, who talks about the most important real estate on the planet is right here between your ears because stories are seeking to come in here and live rent-free in your head. The question is, are you awake enough to see that they're coming and decide, no, not that one. No, I don't (laughs) want to live with you. (laughs) And that unless we actually leave the dance floor and get on the balcony, we can't see who's playing the tune. You know, what story are we in? It needs us to be a little bit separate. That's why the first... um, Story practices, be more curious. So how can I keep asking questions? How can I um, keep determining my level of engagement with things? How do I become aware of the story I'm in? Because it's like that old story of the fish in the water, you know, the two young fish and the old fish swims by and says, hey, boys, how's the water? And those two young fish look at each other and go, what? what's water? <laughs> you know, that's... That's a fun little one, but it's like, can you remain curious? And of course, the first thing you need to do if you want to remain curious is jettison fear. Fear and curiosity cannot remain in the same space together. But fear will make you go into the corner to defend yourself, and that's where a lot of conflict comes from. And the fear lobby has been having a great time recently, kind of stirring up things. I think it's been doing that since 9-11, if not before. But 9-11 was the first time on a planetary level that we had fear make the cycle to everybody and impact everybody. Just like this, COVID-19 is the first time we all have been involved in something totally around the planet personally. Yeah, It's the first time it could happen to me. So the second practice is about being a good story listener. You know, listening is an act of love. 
And it's the first way to reduce conflict is to actually listen to somebody. I think people try to speak louder and more harshly because they feel like they're not being listened to. And our current culture has made everything try to be a sound bite and everything's moving so fast. So this woman who was in pain about my story is not, is, I'm being told my story is untrue, had said that uh, her elder told her that if we dedicate 100 hours to listening, then 99 hours should go to indigenous people because that is one of the core wounds that's operating on the planet that we never pay attention to right at this moment. And I went, I'm up for it. I am up for 99 hours project. I'm up for that. Because one way to release the story of things is to actually give them life because then they start to move. When you have to press it down, press it down, it becomes a stuck story and it begins to poison your system. So the whole question is how can we help stories move? So then there's this whole thing of what stories are we propagating? This one says, start telling the stories that will help us to live well together. So what are we paying attention to? Most of our media is, is kind of depressing and, and awful and like that kind of stuff. But can we illuminate? Can we propagate? Can we stop telling some stories, keep telling some stories, and start telling some stories that are going to be helpful? It's all what we decide to activate that's really there. Then that makes this one really important. Number four is about build your capacity to create spaces where stories can be shared. So that's why I think hosting is incredibly important because all of us should be able to host and harvest conversations that really matter to us. And those kind of skills are, are simple. That doesn't mean it's easy to do in the fire of conflict. That's not easy because you, you get if you get triggered yourself, you can't be so helpful. So you have to really deeply do your own material stand up and do your own material that's what that's what uh, people of color keep telling white people is like hey can you do your own work before you think you're going to be helpful and that's important because the, the more we're triggered the more we fall into our own story the less we can be present to somebody else's so when we do all that work these first five are all about kind of getting the personal capacity right this one is about ask yourself what is mine to do there's an awful lot out there in the world that's calling for attention. But if we try to do everything, well, I'm old enough to remember that Ed Sullivan show used to have at the end, the plate spinner, that guy with like 12 plates on sticks <laughs> going around. And he would have to kind of run back and forth between these trying to keep the plates going. And I feel sometimes like my life is like that. How do I stop getting distracted and say yes to too many things so that I cannot be helpful? Because my energy is precious. And whatever I'm doing, I am trading my life force for. Is it a valuable trade or not? I think that's why a lot of people are unhappy at work, because they realize the trade is not equal. Mm. And they're stuck in a system that would have them say, you're not enough, and you need to buy all this stuff to be enough. That's a, the consumer story is not a happy story. Nobody's happy out of it. Um, Asian countries prove that to us. The ones that have been very poor that still have gross national happiness, they don't get happier by having a lot of stuff, actually. It's not, that's not making us happier. So how do you make a change happen? You know, find your team and lean in and stay connected. And part of that is doing your story work together, you know, telling each other enough stories so that you build a relational field. Because if you don't build a relational field, you can't ride the waves together and it's going to get turbulent. So often we have in our doing this kind of, let's get on to the work. But if we don't know each other in this work, we can't stay together. You know, and when you're doing river rafting, at least in New Zealand, they tell you, they, they tell you about the cocktail position. If you fall out of the boat, keep your feet up so you, the, you, you know, pretend you have a cocktail so your, your feet don't get stuck under the rocks. But what they say is, your job is to paddle like hell so you stay in the boat. So this is about how do our stories help to keep us together so we can lean in when it gets hard, not fall apart and fall out of the boat. Mm. So, you know, this, and it's, it's hard to find a team, but, but it, it takes a field to create a field and host a field. That's what we know from quantum physics. It's the field nature of things that, that will move something. So, you know, we, we talk about the butterfly wing flapping, but actually if there was about three more butterflies, it would be more. <laughs> than just one. So Greta Thunberg might have brought us a lot of, of focus on the climate, but she couldn't do that by herself. And she couldn't have done that on if there weren't people like Al Gore and all those other people before who kept pointing to climate and pointing to climate and Greenpeace and all those people. It, it became a snowball running down the mountain. 
It's not just one person. But one person could start things. But if they have other people around them, like you two guys and you three people making a summit, it's much easier than one person doing it alone. So here's number seven is take courage. Focus. What does that mean? Take courage. Focus on what matters and begin anywhere. So we often think we have to start at the right place. But the you know appreciative inquiry would say, it's the Leonard Cohen moment. Move where the cra- move to the crack where the light's coming in. Move to that place where there's energy and start working there. And then that energy is going to become a magnetic attractor. You know, I often think with activists, it's not about going up against something. When you go up against something, you become part of that system. But if you go over there and make a campfire and become a magnetic strange attractor, people are going to go like, what are they doing over there? That looks cool. I'm going to join them. So I see a lot of people who are getting burnt out in conflict and challenge and part of the thing is if you keep being against something what are you for and could you could you create that party that we want to join like in order to do the serious work there needs to be some lightness that's why there's there's black humor and gallows humor in the healthcare industry because it's so hard and also one thing that is coming for me is that you actually lean into the center where is the problem instead of leaning into the margins or to the cracks, as you were saying, or, you know, like to the, it's like somehow the problem is, is the solution. So instead of like looking and saying the, this center is wrong and you give the power to it, you shift your attention. Yeah. Or, or as David Isaacs, Juanita Brown's partner would say, the shift and, and Peter Block and others, you know, the shift mm-hmm. is from problem solving to possibility. Right? Exactly. As as, even when we're looking for solutions, we're still stuck in the problem frame and the fixing yeah. notion, as opposed to what's really possible here that, that takes yeah. us to a whole other realm, that campfire you want to invite. Which is why in the art of hosting community, we don't tend to work with vision statements. We work with calling questions. So, mm-hmm. and a lot of people can really identify what they don't want. They can't identify what they do want. So I remember working with a client who I said, so how do we go? And he went, well, that wasn't bad. And I was like, so would you say it was good? And he said, I said that wasn't bad. I'm like, oh, <laughs> come, come on. I mean, this was the New Zealand language said anyway, but which is kind of negatively focused. Maybe not so much these days. New Zealand's doing really well. Here's number eight, practice number eight. If it's about them, don't do it without them. So there's so much work we do where whoever it is that we're trying to assist is not even in the room. You know, like, around education. So we talked a little bit about education before. Why is the education story stuck? Because it's based on the industrial model of turning out people to feed the industry. And it's still based in that mindset, even though we know so much about brain research and how the brain works and how all you have to do is read Daniel Quinn's book, My Ishmael. And there's one called, uh, yeah, there's Ishmael, but My Ishmael is the one he did in the series, which is about education. And it's really uh, proposing that if you give kids things they were really, really passionate to work on, they will learn everything else. And voraciously, you cannot keep them away from learning, because all of this is set up to learn. So it's interesting to then ask the question, what conflict stories have been teaching us to stay in conflict? That just occurred to me right in that moment, but it's a really good, interesting question. Uh, Here we go. Focus on the possible and dream the impossible. So this is this picture actually comes from Zimbabwe. It's in a place called Kafunda Village, which is all about Kafunda means learning, the Shona language. And so Kafunda Learning Village is actually learning twice. <laughs> but I picked this photo because I wanted to honor those people who could, in their imagination, see a forest, and they started off just by planting trees, one at a time. And they knew, like, 50 years later, they might not see it, but they were determined to do the dream anyway. So they started on what was possible and just kept dreaming the impossible the whole time. What would it be like? And then the last one for me is this one of, of commit to being a learner, keep practicing. Because when we think we're in learning and we think we're experimenting, it's so much easier than having to get it right. Can I please be in an experiment with you? I'd like to experiment on how to change the story of this world. What do you say? Wait, are you in? You know, kind of <laughs> <laughs> There's something really interesting. And, Last point, there is um, some work from the Corimela Peace Center. And let me just share this one because it has direct things about um, conflict in it. This is their iceberg model. Corimela Peace Center in Northern Ireland was set up after the Troubles. This is Colin Craig, who used to be the the 
the head of the Cormiel Peace Center telling me about this iceberg. This is the only picture I have of it. So I'm just going to honor Colin in this moment. So they know they can track easily how conflict escalates. It forms in some way. There's an intensification of it. There's an escalation. And it, this usually has to do with falling into the kind of potent story about right and wrong and all that kind of stuff that really gets the reptile brain going. And then there's things you can do to recover, reconnect. You can see this is a long uh, a long journey down to reconciliation. What the Cormula Peace Center would say that they've discovered over time is that this iceberg, like all icebergs, has 90% of it underneath the water. And what's under the water is the narrative. So those people who are attached to the main protagonists, if you remember kind of the peace talks in Northern Ireland, the main protagonists came to a new agreement. But unless the people who are attached to them start telling a new story, in fact, it's the story that's told at the breakfast table. It's the story the mothers tell, the grandmothers tell, the friends tell, that makes the difference between whether something can last or not. Mm. So our stories are, are dramatically impacting how we face the world at every moment. And I think it's a human capacity and a human ability that we need to grow to pay attention and be awake to our stories. So, you know, we live in a story and we can change it, but first we have to be awake to it. That's a beautiful way to, to finish our conversation, Mary Alice. Thank you so much for the time and, uh, and, and yeah, for, for being who you are and sharing your gifts. Thank you. You're so welcome. Yeah, I mean, I love, on the one hand, you talk about the value of experimenting and, and continuing to learn, but clearly you're so fully grounded in, in what you have learned and able to, to present it with such clarity and force. Um, you know, the truth of what you speak just is so present and valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm wishing good story wins to all people who are listening. And um, please keep in touch and please stay in conversation. Please keep sharing good stories because the world needs them right now. Thank you.